I had the opportunity to hear a fascinating presentation on parasite case studies from the author of an excellent blog. It's called Creepy, Dreadful, Wonderful Parasites. Some fantastic uh, adjectives there. Uh, joining me on the phone is the Director of Clinical Parasitology and an Associate Professor of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and the aforementioned blogger, Dr. Bobby Pritt. Hello, Dr. Pritt, and thanks for joining me today. Hi, Robert. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's nice to hear your voice again. Yes, you too. Okay. Well, uh, before we start talking about any of the case studies, um, I recall you opened up your talk in Jacksonville speaking about the role of blogging, social media, uh, when it comes to topics such as parasitology and other uh, topics of medicine, and clearly I've been involved in this for years myself, um, it's a very useful and positive thing. Uh, can you give me some thoughts on that? Sure. I've uh, found blogging uh, to be a really great way to share cases, share educational material, and really just develop a, a great community of people that share your interest, be it something as obscure as parasites or something more mainstream like politics. Absolutely. And and I have checked out your blog, and you do have quite a following. And uh, yep, parasol parasitology is something of a tight community. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, it's a very specialized field, and because people are all around the world, it would be really hard to reach out to all of them individually. I uh, honestly never really thought much about blogging until I decided, decided to start sharing cases, and I just realized what all of the benefits that came with having a, a weekly blog. Yeah, and, and of course, as you said, you, you're getting a lot of uh, visitors from overseas, and mm -hmm. in the topic of parasitology... It tends to be a lot more interesting overseas. Well, it's a lot more commonplace overseas as yeah. well. All right. Well, let's go ahead and jump right into creepy, dreadful, wonderful parasites. I, I get a kick out of the title. <laughs> Thank you. And um, actually, I was going over some of the cases. And I, I thought I'd have to dig and dig it. Well, no. The most recent cases are very, very fascinating to me. Oh, uh, yeah. So let's look at and what, what Dr. Pritt does on her blog um, it's a weekly case study, and she gives a little bit of uh, text information about it, puts a few pictures, and she offers up the question, you know, what is it? And the next week, um, she'll go onto the blog and give the answer uh, to the uh, question of the week before. It's a very, very uh, well set up uh, blog. And on the, from case um, week 292, um, you have a situation where a uh, patient was infected with two free-living amoebas. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, definitely. Well, um, like you mentioned, uh, parasites are, are pretty common overseas, but in the United States, we're pretty lucky. We don't have a lot of parasites. There are a few, but not a lot that we have to worry about. But when you get in a situation where your immune system is compromised and your body just can't fight parasites the way um, a healthy person would, you become at risk for things that are really kind of unusual. And this particular case was a woman in her 70s that had cancer, and she was being treated with chemotherapy, so it was suppressing her immune system. And she got infected with a type of amoeba that lives in the environment. And these are called free-living amoebae, meaning they really are free-living. They would rather live in the environment, in the water, in the soil, than in us because actually we're kind of a dead end for them. But if they happen to get into our skin, say on a cut or in uh, contaminated contact lenses, for example, mm -hmm. uh, they can be really devastating. And this poor lady, um, she probably had a very small cut in her skin and got exposed to water or soil that have these amoeba that live in the environment around us. And they got into our skin and started invading into our tissue. And uh, one of the pictures I showed actually was really scary for me when I saw it because it was a, a blood vessel that was surrounded by these amoebae, and they were getting ready to invade into the blood vessel because that's what they do. They get into the blood, and then they travel usually throughout the body to the brain. Okay. They can cause death. And, and what are these amoeba called? Uh, well, acanthamoeba and balamuthia are 
two of the ones that um, can cause this. And we actually did PCR on this specimen, and it, it turned out she had a canthamoeba. We tend to just group them together and call them free-living amoebae. Um, there's a similar related one that children get, usually children, adults as well, when they go swimming and diving into sure. water. Mm-hmm. There's usually several cases of this reported every summer, um, usually in warm water when the temperatures are high, and that, that can be very deadly. Thankfully, in this case, by looking at that biopsy, it came to my uh, desk. I have a microscope, and I, I take consults, and uh, I was able to recognize these, and we were able to intervene and catch this before it went to her brain. Oh, outstanding. Well, you know, it's interesting, uh, and forgive my pronunciation of the second uh, genera, Balamuthia? Yes, Balamuthia, mandrillaris, okay. originally described in a mandrill. Right. Now, I, I remember on a different website I used to work on, um, I covered a couple stories in 2009 and then 2010 of uh, human-to-human transfer via organ transplantation. Do you recall that? Yeah, th- that would be very rare, but it can happen. And there was one case, right, where the patient had died kind of mysteriously. They didn't really know what the cause was, and then they took a lot of the organs because he was an organ donor, not realizing that they were infected with that parasite. Yeah. So that's at a real risk because you put that into a person who uh, receives that organ and their immune system is suppressed so that they don't attack the organ. So they're also at risk for this type of a rare infection. Sure. And, and there's really no way for a um, transplant lab to even look for something like that. No, not by the current methods we use. I mean, luckily, again, this is very rare, but it's one of those things that is just a very bad situation. Sure. Um Fascinating. Let's go ahead and take a look at case 291. Oh, Uh, sure. Yeah. Now, this is a case uh, from a Congo immigrant to the United States, and you found uh, a strange little nematode. Tell, (laughs) Tell us more about that. Yeah, sure. Well, this I thought was kind of an interesting case and a good contrast to our last case because it really... Uh, draws attention to the fact that there are a lot of parasites out there, especially in places like sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Southeast Asia, that we just don't worry about. I mean, we don't usually think about getting, for example, bitten by a mosquito and getting a worm. Uh, We usually don't worry about walking barefoot in the soil and getting worms. Um, But there are many parts of the world where that's an everyday occurrence. And and this patient came from Congo and had been bitten by an insect and got a worm in his blood. And that worm basically swims around. It's tiny, microscopic, um, in the blood. uh, But the adult crawls through the tissues, crawls right underneath your skin. Um, Sometimes it crawls across your eye which can be very disturbing, as you can imagine, for the Mm -hmm. patients. Um, This particular patient presented as the worm was probably crawling through his arm. So his arm had been swelling up, and and it had been moving the swelling as the worm was moving. So it's a pretty characteristic appearance. The physicians had a pretty good idea what they were dealing with, so they took a blood sample, sent it to my lab. We looked at um, some of that blood under the microscope stained with Gimsa, and we saw these tiny little worms swimming in between your red blood cells. And you identified it as? Uh, loa loa. Also known as the African eye worm, I believe? Right. And it's called the eye worm because, as I mentioned earlier, it sometimes crawls across the conjunctiva, the surface of the eye. And that's visible and noticeable by the patient. Now, now is this treatable? Yes. It is, easily. Uh, There's a a number of different drugs that can be used, and usually just after a a routine course, the patient is cured. It's more of a problem when the patient is actually in an endemic area. So let's say sub-Saharan Africa, you can cure them, but chances are they're going to continue to get bit by insects and continue to get reinfected. But in the United States, thankfully, Mm -hmm. after this patient was cured, the chance of him getting reinfected is, is very low. If he never leaves the United States, it would be zero. Exactly. And, and, and you keep on talking about an insect. What is the vector of Loa Loa? Um, it is the deer fly, the Chrysops deer fly. Yeah. Now, so as a medical parasitologist at the Mayo Clinic, you would only expect this in, from, I mean, it's pretty much restricted to Africa. So immigrants from Africa mm-hmm. and U.S. travelers going to Africa. Well, so that's a really good point you bring up. We are increasingly um, a mobile society, and so 
It is true. You have to leave the United States in order to get a lot of these rare parasites, at least rare for the United States. Um, but we have a lot of people that travel. Ecotourism is very popular. People like to go to cool places and sleep outside in the jungle under the stars. Unfortunately, they get bitten by sand flies and all sorts of other things while they're doing that. And then we have a lot of immigrants coming to the United States looking for a better quality of life. So even though I practice in Rochester, Minnesota, I get to see a whole wide variety of really fascinating and sometimes very rare cases. Yeah, and and in, in your part of the country, um, I believe there's a real African immigrant population there, too. Yes, we have the largest Somali immigrant population uh, in the state of Minnesota for the whole United States. It's the largest. So it, you don't have to be in a large city anymore to see these rare things. You could be in a very rural setting in the Midwest and still have... Um, travelers and immigrants in your community. Fantastic. I, I enjoy that very much. And uh, your most current one, I know you haven't given out the answer yet, and I want to go ahead and try to guess it. <laughs> sure. And um, you have a 24-year-old male. Uh, several hairs from his groin were submitted, okay. and looks like there's, I don't know, a nymph on it? Uh, or, well, or, yeah, it does look like that, and it probably is. You're probably seeing inside of the egg mm-hmm. or nick. Structure. The nick. Okay, and I'm a, since you said groin, I have to assume it's uh, the pubic crab. It is. It is. Yep, the pubic louse. Okay, so can you tell us more? It's known as crabs because they have crab-like claws. Sure. Can you tell us more about that disease or okay. infestation? Well, Yes, it's mostly sexually transmitted, so close contact person to person, and um, it's somewhat rare in the United States, but we still see a good number of cases. Usually doesn't cause a lot of problems. It's more of just it's socially embarrassing to the person, and it can cause a rash and irritation, but it's really just that it's more of a social problem and the fact that it's sexually transmitted. Very interesting. I don't know if you were uh, if you heard the story that came out of China um, the past couple days about the guy that went to the hospital and he had all kinds of issues with his head and stuff. And they did a CAT scan and they found nineteen tania larvae up there, cystocercosis. Oh wow! Yeah, and apparently he was. Uh, he said he goes, "I drank too much pig's blood." Yeah, so, yeah, that's a kind of a new story that's out there. Um, and one last thing I wanted to ask you before I let you go and go enjoy your Saturday. Um, in the United States, as far as parasites, what do you expect to see, if anything? Well, there are a number of parasites that still are here in the United States. Um, they tend to be things like um, pinworm, very common. Sure. Probably because it's transmitted from person to person, it doesn't require poor sanitation and in unclean water. It just it's transferred from the hands of one child to the hands and mouth of another child. Mm-hmm. Uh, things like head lice, though that's extremely common. And then the most common intestinal parasites that are diagnosed on stool exam would be Giardia and Cryptosporidium. And we usually get that by drinking... Um, or eating contaminated food or surface water. Giardia is really common when people go camping in the summertime and they drink out of that what looks to be a pristine mountain stream, but it's really taking runoff probably from a beaver dam upstream. Sure. And uh, then they end up with a pretty nasty, unpleasant diarrheal illness that can last uh, and go on for quite some time if not treated. So it's not that we don't have parasites. We have a few Thankfully, they're um, not necessarily related to poor water and uh, unclean food supply. All right. Well, I I really appreciate you coming on, and I want to encourage listeners uh, to check out her excellent blog. Just Google Creepy, Dreadful, Wonderful Parasites, and I assure you, you won't be disappointed. Um, I've been speaking to Dr. Bobby Pritt, uh, Parasitology Director at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Thank you, ma'am, and I hope to have you on again in the future. Thank you, Robert. It's been a pleasure. All right. You take care now. You too. Bye-bye.